say I will and I will to the gospel according to Jesus Christ and accept Christ as their personal Savior. Maybe one of my brothers and sisters, one of my sons and daughters might need reconciliation today, God. And today, God, they might be reconciled unto you, Father. Restored, Father. So now you take the work that you set them out to do. Lord, I love you. I say week after week because it's true. I have prepared, but I need your power. Yeah. I study, but I need to stand with your strength. Lord, you know I am ready and willing. But only you can make me able for this moment. Grass with us, the flower fades, the word of our God shall stand forever. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Y'all be God's praise. How many of y'all happy to be in the house of the Lord? Oh, God, 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 in this moment right here. Amen. And uh, if you have your Bible, why don't you turn me to the book of Lamentations. Book of Lamentations. A couple, couple of things I want to look at today. A couple, couple of texts. So I'm going to have you exercise a little bit. Book of Lamentations, chapter 3. And I need you to go to 1 Thessalonians in the New Testament, chapter 5. And then I need you to be in 2 Timothy, chapter 2. Lamentations, chapter 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and then 2 Timothy chapter 2. You stand to your feet by the Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. It'll be up on the board. Hallelujah. Well, it might be up on the board, but it may not. But if it's not on the board, guess what you have to do? After looking your Bible. Lamentations. Book of Lamentations, amen, amen. If I receive this word, with my mind only, it will be dead for me. But if I receive this word, with the spirit over my mind, it will be life for me. And when your kingdom becomes my priority, its impact will be my reality. Lord, I don't need religious form or fashion. I need mean light. Who's I mean my favorite to see light? Smiles to see light. Please to see light. Amen. Amen. Lamentation chapter 3, verses 21 to 23. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, 21 to 23. This I recall to my mind. Therefore have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions they are not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Yeah. First Thessalonians. Let's go to First Thessalonians. Let's go to chapter. Uh, let's go to chapter. What did I say? Five. First, First Thessalonians chapter five, right around verse twenty-four. It says this. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Second Timothy, just a couple books over. Second Timothy, chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, because he cannot deny himself. You may be seated. We're going to preach for the title, God is Faithful. God is Faithful. Um, over the past few months and, you know, during the course of the year, a lot of times we, we, we discuss, if you come to church any period of time, we discuss this issue of, or the subject of faithfulness. Uh, we have, we discuss uh, the faithfulness of our faith, uh, we discussed the faithfulness of our congregation, our church, our family, and ministry. Uh, but today, I want to take a different look at the aspect of faithfulness. Uh, we're going to consider God's faithfulness. That's what we're going to consider. I found something that when you consider God's faithfulness, you leave the place knowing that everything's going to be all right. 
And so today we're going to consider God's faithfulness. But now I need you to understand that God's faithfulness is both hard to comprehend and it's inspiring at the same time. It's hard to comprehend that God would be faithful to us. Uh, that does not even sound logical. God doesn't need anyone. God is not dependent on anyone. God is not accountable to anyone. However, the Bible teaches us that God is a faithful God. Uh, and this concept is inspiring. God is faithful. And to me, that is wonderful. That is wonderful. And, you know, I have to, I have to uh, uh, admit right now at the beginning of the sermon that, uh, that the faithfulness of God is a very deep and complex subject. I, I looked up the word God in the name's topical Bible. In other words, God, I looked up the word faithfulness. There are over 125 references to God's faithfulness just in Maeve's topical Bible. Uh, that list is not comprehensive. I would not pretend to be able to cover the subject of God's faithfulness in just one sermon. In fact, I would never pretend to be able to cover uh, the faithfulness of God completely at all. That would be arrogant of me. Be arrogant of anybody that can think they can get up and talk about the complete faithfulness of God because it is incomprehensible. God's faithfulness to you and to me is incomprehensible. In other words, you just can't even understand why God is so faithful to you. He can your mind around there. You know, kids recognize, I think the more we know, the adults get hard-headed, the adults think they know everything, but kids, kids recognize that some things are incomprehensible. A father was at the beach with his children when his four-year-old son ran up to him and grabbed his hand and led him to the shore where a seagull had laid dead in the sand. And the, the son said, Daddy, what happened to him? And Dad said, you know, and all of his, you know, what Dad said is that, son, he died and went to heaven. The boy thought for a moment and said, well, did God throw him back down? <laughs> the boy had trouble comprehending death. Another, another case, a three-year-old girl named Renee prayed this prayer. She said, Our Father, who art in heaven, who art in heaven, hallowed is thy name. She had trouble comprehending the Lord's prayer. Some things about God, Cornerstone, family and friends, are hard to comprehend. And here's the thing. The things you know about God, you read in the Bible. And there are things about God, about himself, that he didn't even place in the Bible. So you, you got to wrap your mind around that. What you know about God, he let you know about him. There are some things about him you can't even go to the know about him. It's hard to comprehend. I, I, you know, so I read those few passages in the scriptures, uh, and that was just my introduction. Of, I, I want to make a few simple statements about God's faithfulness this morning. Uh, my primary focus today is acknowledging God's faithfulness to us. God's faithfulness to us. The, those three scriptures that I wrote, uh, they are simple statements about God's faithfulness. And, and, and during the course of this sermon, I'm going to ask you to affirm these truths. Amen? Amen. So, so for some of y'all who sleep like, you know, my boy Eutychus, wake up. Amen. Because I'm going to ask you to affirm some of these truths. Here's point number one, truth number one. God is faithful to people who love him. All right? God is faithful, write this down, to people who love him. Uh, in, in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9, it says this. Therefore, now that the Lord your God, or therefore know that the Lord your God, he is God. The faithful God who keeps a covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love them and keep his commandments, right? God keeps covenants for thousands of generations for those who love him and keep his commandments. That's Deuteronomy 7 9. That text illustrates God's faithfulness to his people, and we need to know that God is faithful to his people. Yeah. Now, God is faithful to those who love him. How do I show my love to God? By obeying his commands. How do I show my love to God? By worshiping. How do I show my love to God? Being faithful to what he has called me to do. Uh, there's, a, um, there, there's something called the Velcro effect. It's a term.
term that I believe describes the relationship between God's faithfulness and to us and our need for Him. The Velcro effect. In 1948, for those of you who don't know, and I, I love this history stuff sometimes, I read a lot of a Swiss engineer, a Swiss mountaineer named George Mestrel uh, was walking through the woods and he was very frustrated by the birds that clung to his clothes. You ever been out there? Remember when you were a kid and you was out in the woods and you playing and running around the field and you get stickers and birds to your clothes, right? I grew up out in the woods, right? You had to worry about birds and ticks and stickers and all that kind of stuff, right? And so they clung to his clothes and while picking them off, uh, George realized that it might be possible to use this principle to make a fastener to compete with the zipper. And so Velcro was inspired by the natural sticking properties of birds. And if you look at Velcro, if you look at a Velcro strip, and some of you see just in here, uh, and tails in here might know what I'm talking about, you'll notice that it has two parts to it. A strip that has a web of tiny hooks, and a strip that has a web of tiny interwoven hoops. Uh, these two strips are a match for each other, and when you join them together, uh, the hooks catch the loops, and they become meshed together in a very strong bond. Deuteronomy 7 says, God is faithful to those who love him and keep his commandments. Love him, keep his commandments. Love him, keep his commandments. This begins to form this bond. This begins to form a bond to the faithfulness of God. If you need, if you know, if you need in affirming that God is faithful to his people, you have to understand that God is faithful to people who love him. It's simple as that. God is faithful to people that he recognizes. To people who love him. We now listen, now repeat after me, some of y'all are first asleep. Say, we affirm, we affirm God is faithful, God is faithful to, those to those who love him. That's who God is faithful to. A uh, 54 year old woman had a heart attack. She was taken to the hospital for about a year old with me, right? She was 54, a while on the operating table. She had a near death experience on the operating table and seeing uh, God, and, and she saw God, and, and she said, My time up. God said, no, 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 you got another 43 years, two months, and eight days to live. And upon that, she was happy about that, Brother Bill. And upon recovery, the woman decided to stay in the hospital. I'm going to have a facelift. I'm going to have light suction. I'm going to get some implants. I'm going to get a tummy tuck. Uh, I, I, she even had somebody come in there and change the color of her hair and brighten her teeth. And, and she had so much time to live, she figured she might as well just spruce it all up, right? And after the last operation, she was released from the hospital, but while crossing the street on the way home, she was killed by an ambulance. So she gets in front of God. She said, God, I thought you said I had 43 years. Why in the world did you put me? Or why did you pull me out of the path of the ambulance? And God replied, I didn't recognize you. Charles H. Spurgeon, the Prince of Three Preachers, 
was walking through an English countryside with a friend, and they strolled along, and the evangelist, and, 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 and Spurgeon was a bad boy, and the, the Scottish evangelist noticed the barn with a weather vane on its roof, and at the top of the vane were the words, God is love, right? God is love. Spurgeon remarked to his companion who he's walking with that he thought it was rather inappropriate to place that message it was an inappropriate place for that message. Weather vanes are changeable, he says, Charles says, but God is constant. And, and uh, he says, I don't agree with you about those words, replied his friend. His friend said, Charles, I don't agree with you about what you just said. He said, Charles, I believe you misunderstood the meaning. That sign is indicating a truth. The truth is, regardless of which way the wind blows, God is love. Because he can't deny himself. Listen, I'm going to really help somebody in here. On a good day in your life, God is love. On a bad day in your life, God is love. When you're healthy, God is love. When you're sick, God is love. When you got money in the bank, God is love. When you broke, God is love. No Those who, those, those who are, are told 
will in turn tell other people about me, and my story will be spread to the farthest reaches of the globe. That's my plan, Gabriel. Ultimately, all of mankind will have heard about my life and what I have done. Gabriel frowned and looked rather skeptical. He knew he knew well the, the he knew well the poor stuff that human beings are made of. And yes, he said, but, but what if Peter, James, and John were weary? What if people who come after them forget? What if they, what if down through the centuries, people just don't tell others about you? Haven't you made any other plans? And Jesus answered and said, listen, Gabriel, I ain't got no other plans. Whatever plans I made will come to pass. Because God is faithful to his plan. We have to be God is faithful to his plan. God 
problem. Stop being out of your way. I know this is an addition to the four points today. Stop being out of your way. God is faithful to forgive. Matter of fact, 1 John 1 9 said, We confess our sins, man. He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God is faithful to forgive. He's faithful. I don't know how you feel. You might be feeling low down. You might be feeling ashamed of yourself. You might be feeling in, in a place, a rock place. How can God forgive me? God knows that what you needed most was forgiveness. Oh, Chuck Swindon, I'll put it this way in the Great Awakening. I, I, I like Pastor Chuck. He says this. He says, if my greatest need had been information, God would have sent you an educator. If my greatest need had been technology, God would have sent you a scientist. If your greatest need had been money, God would have sent you an economist. If your greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent you an entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness, so God sent us a savior. That's what God sent. That's who God sent. He gave us a savior. And then, and then not only is he going faithful to forgive or promises to forgive, God is faithful to be with us. He's faithful to be with us. How do you know? How do I know? Because of Jesus' commission to his disciples, he said, Lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. That's Matthew 28, 19. And, 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 and I, I know that no matter what we go through, God is always there. And I, and I love I love how, how our good brother David puts it in Psalm 23. He says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He made me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restored my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. From verse 4, here it is, going to stop. Here's the promise. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy God and thy staff, they comfort me. He promised always to be with me. Then he said, Thou prepare a table that I will throw me the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head. And the Lord, my cup runs over. Sure, I am goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house. I will dwell in the house. I will dwell in the house of the Lord. Lord. He promised me. Promised you. They all. Thank you, Lord. I'm done now, but for preaching, Tony Campalo tells a story. Being in a church of Oregon, Tony Campalo had the gift of healing, you know, praying for people when they get healed. And he was asked to pray for a man who had cancer. Campalo prayed boldly for the man's healing. And that next week, he got a telephone call from the man's wife. She said, you prayed for my husband. He had cancer. Campalo thought that when he heard her used the past tense verb that his cancer had been eradicated, as we thought. But before he could think much about what she said, uh, she says he died. Mm -hmm. And Kampala felt terrible. But she continued, don't feel bad, brother. When he came into that church that Sunday, he was filled with anger. He knew he was going to be dead in a short period of time. He hated God. Mm -hmm. He was 58 years old. He wanted to see his children and grandchildren grow up. He was angry that this all-powerful God didn't take away his sickness and heal him. He would lie in bed and curse God. The more his anger grew towards God, the more miserable he was to everybody around him. It was an awful thing to be in his presence. But the lady told Kapal, after you prayed for him, a peace came over him. And a joy had come into him. And Tony, the last three days <clears throat> have been the best days of our lives. We sung, we laughed, we read scripture, we prayed. All oh, they've been wonderful days, preacher. And I call to thank you for laying your hands on him and praying for healing. And then she said something incredibly profound. She said, he wasn't cured, but he has been healed. <laughs>
places, but where we are, and it's people. 